or recesses of the subcommittee at any time. I welcome everyone to today's meeting uh, on HR 40. Before we begin, explain to remind members that we have established an email address and distribution list dedicated to circulating exhibits, motions, or other written materials that members might want to offer as part of our hearings today. If you would like to submit materials, please send them to judiciarydocs at mail.house.gov and we will have them distributed to members and staff as quickly as possible. Okay. I'll now recognize myself for an opening statement. The enslavement of people of African American descent in uh, America was started before we were a country in 1619 and has gone on for uh, through, through the end of the Civil War. Uh, the uh, effects this has had, a, this has been a crime against humanity and the effects it's had on our society and on African Americans in general continue to uh, cause difficulties for people uh, in America. Uh, and everything from racial inequality, uh, econ economic opportunities, which have been uh, manifest, and disparate health outcomes, which have been uh, so, so sad and sad and come to much light recently, but gone on for centuries and to the plague of unjustified police violence against black Americans. Slavery was our nation's original sin. Our constitution protected it, embodying various compromises that gave disproportionate power to slave states. For example, the three-fifths clause, which we always hear about, counted a slave as three-fifths of a person for population counts, which in turn gave disproportionate representation to slave states in the House of Representatives, and accordingly in the Electoral College, which was created uh, as a way to elect a president, uh, and that gave slave states another avenue to exercise disproportionate influence over national affairs. In essence, slaves counted for three-fifths toward the representation in Congress and the Electoral College, but it gave slaves nothing. It gave their masters something, and it gave them more power. And, and so it was not Congress wasn't made up of representation of people who had rights and who uh, were, were free people. It was representative of, of in the South of people who didn't. And then it was a compromise that uh, uh, stained our Constitution. Uh, it is only fitting then that in the midst of a continuing reckoning over police treatment of um, Black people and a pandemic that has disproportionately impacted Black Americans, that we should hold this hearing today on HR 40, the commission to study and develop reparation proposals to, for African Americans Act. Uh, our colleague, Representative Sheila Jackson Lee, who's a member of the subcommittee, is the current lead sponsor of this legislation. I'm proud to be and have been an original co-sponsor uh, ever since I came to Congress in 2007. Uh, Chairman Nadler's with us, who's also a longtime co-sponsor of the bill. Uh, great, the greatest credit for HR 40 belongs really to two individuals. Uh, first and foremost, our former colleague and the former chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, my friend, my mentor, and, and my political father when I came to Congress, the late John Conyers Jr. He first introduced this legislation over 30 years ago and reintroduced it every Congress thereafter until his retirement. Uh, he, he named it H.R. 40 for the promise that was given slaves after the Civil War for having 40 acres and a mule. And that's where H.R. 40 came from. Uh, John Conyers was a great man and a great leader and should properly re remembered here today. The second individual most responsible for H.R. 40 is unfortunately uh, 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 one of the most despised characters in American history, John Wilkes Booth. You know, why John Wilkes Booth? Because when he assassinated Abraham Lincoln, uh, that led to Andrew Johnson becoming the president of the United States, and President Johnson effectively rescinded the promise made by General William Tecumseh Sherman to former slaves that they would each be guaranteed that 40 acres of land and that mule, that each person uh, would be, they'd become free as free persons, a promise that colloquially referred to as 40 acres and a mule. That ended with the assassination of President Lincoln, and it really started off a, uh, serious problems in our country. And, uh, uh, shortchanged the newly freed Americans. H.R. 40 would create a commission to study the history of slavery in America, the role of the federal and state governments in supporting slavery and racial discrimination, other forms of discrimination against the descendants of slaves, and the lingering effects of slavery on African Americans. The commission would also make recommendations as to appropriate ways to educate the American public about its findings and appropriate remedies in light of those findings. And I want to digress for a minute and mention a hearing we had. It might have been the first full hearing we had on HR 40 back in about 2007 or 2008. 
One of our witnesses was Charles Ogletree, one of the giants uh, in the uh, uh, courtroom and with the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. He said at that time, H.R. 40 was a study of reparations. It may not be the 21st century equivalent of a, a, a 40 acres and a mule and the 21st century equivalent, he said, was an SUV and a condo. He said it might be gigantic programs to help people, particularly African-Americans, but others who have been disproportionately affected in health care and economic opportunity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, an honest reckoning with the federal government's role in protecting the institution of slavery has been a leading priority of my congressional career. Uh, back in 2007, I introduced HR, HRS 194. That was my first year in Congress. An apology by the House of Representatives for its role in perpetuating both slavery and its noxious offspring, Jim Crow. The House ultimately passed that resolution that year with the help of the chairman, Mr. Conyers, who put it on the suspension calendar, and we passed it in 2008 by a voice vote. As I noted, my resolution is it was not just slavery itself that was wrong, but also the visceral racism against persons of African descent upon which American slavery depended, a racism that wanted to become entrenched in the nation's social fabric and evil that we must continue to confront today. Um, my resolution emphasized the, the white slavery was our nation's original sin, while slavery was our nation's original sin, the underlying sin of anti-black racism not end with the Civil War and the 13th Amendment, and Congress's inaction and acquiescence in the face of such racism was a, a big reason why. Uh, the Senate passed a resolution similar to ours, but not quite the same uh, the, in the following Congress. We unfortunately didn't pass them at the same time and have a joint resolution, but the Senate passed an apology as well. And uh, uh, that, that was a good act by the Senate. It's unfortunate we weren't able to put them together. Uh, I recently, I watched a couple of movies in the last couple of days. Uh, Chadwick Boseman's movies uh, about uh, uh, Jackie Robinson and one about Thurgood Marshall. And in those movies, I was so affected by what you saw. And I know they're movies, but they reflected life. And the, and the racism that Jackie Robinson faced getting into baseball, that was 1947 when he was with Montreal and then the Dodgers. Racism from the, from the coaches, from the other players, and from the fans. It was just disgusting. Uh, and, and Thurgood Marshall faced the same thing in uh, up in Connecticut when he and Mr. Friedman were representing a criminal defendant. Mr. Friedman faced it too. Uh, some of the, the racists that, that uh, took out actions against African-Americans took it out against the Jewish man too. Uh, the attorney calling him a kike and beating him up. So there's been a whole lot of horror in our nation's past and a lot of it's been racism that is still we suffer from. Racism became further entrenched after slavery's end as reflected in the societal attitudes and Jim Crow laws as the system of racial segregation laws intended to separate and, uh, and uh, unequal societies for whites and African-Americans that was enforced through both official means, uh, which I unfortunately saw as a young child, colored water fountains, colored restrooms, colored sections at the football stadium, Mr. Mr. Owens. When I went to the football stadium here in Memphis, the place for African-Americans to sit for the big SEC football games was in the end zone, in the lower corner, in the lower 10 rows, the only thing they could have done to make the seats worse would have put to put a hot dog stand in front of the to, to interfere with the the uh, vision. It was just unbelievable what they did to the un unequal uh, opportunities. But there was also lynchings, even worse, and and they were advertised and and, and people came to watch the lynchings and and get body parts and to cheer. It was just disgusting. This was around the turn of the century and through the 1900s. Uh, there was violence, intimidation, and disenfranchisement mostly in the South, but other places as well. It was not until 100 years after the end of slavery that Congress, under pressure from the Civil Rights Movement, uh, Thurgood Marshall's work, Dr. King's work, uh, Baird Rustin and others, finally earned, uh, carried on, out its duty to end Jim Crow by passing the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and other core civil rights statutes better fulfilling the Constitution's guarantee of equal citizenship for all. And while those great civil rights leaders were greatly responsible, for the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, and certainly our, our late colleague John Lewis was too. Something that sometimes is forgotten in those facts is that the assassination of John Kennedy, a second assassination of an American president, uh, although we had others in between uh, President McKinley, uh, but President Kennedy's assassination led to an outpouring of, of, of support for these acts that Lyndon Johnson was able to help um, uh, 
bring into legislation. He nurtured them and brought them forth. But while the, the, the assassination of Abraham Lincoln hurt the effort at having a, a opportunity, the assassination of John Kennedy unfortunately helped it. Today, our nation continues to struggle with the legacy of the anti-Black racism that undergirded slavery and Jim Crow. We see this in statistics that paint a bleak future, a blank, bleak picture. For instance, according to the Census Bureau, 18.8 percent of African Americans lived in poverty in 2019, compared to 7.3 percent of non-Hispanic whites who lived in poverty. The Washington Post reported last year that in 2016, the net worth of African American households was $13,024, which was less than 10 percent, less than 10 percent of the $149,000 net worth of non-Hispanic white households. Limited access to wealth building resources and opportunities have led to this stark disparity. For instance, African Americans continue to face discrimination in the workplace. They also have limited access to educational opportunities, according to the National Education Association. The high school graduation rate for African Americans was 67% compared to the nationwide average of 81%. They also continue to face racial segregation in housing and discrimination in the availability of quality health care services and most other facts of life. The COVID-19 pandemic has only exaggerated the effect of the structural racial disparities. Workers on the front lines at low paying jobs, often um, not covered by unions in the South uh, and collective bargaining and, uh, and, and lower wages and, and, and contact with people on the front lines where COVID-19 has spread. Enacting HR 40 would be an important step in finding effective long-term solutions to these problems, ones that can trace their origins to our nation's shameful history of slavery and anti-Black racism. Professor Ogletree of Harvard noted, uh, as I've mentioned earlier, about the 40 acres and a mule, but he also put a focus on the poorest of the poor, including efforts to address comprehensively the problems of those who have not substantially benefited from integration or affirmative action. I hope our hearing today can lead to a fruitful conversation with the hope of achieving that goal. I thank our witnesses for being here today and look forward to their testimony.